And now, Dr. Krieger's lecture program starts right now. If you go into the, uh, if, you're, if, if you're new or you know of somebody um, that might want help concerning their health, be aware, these are the topics that, um, that I have on video right now that um, I, I feel explain in detail how nutritionally you can help somebody with a lot of these, uh, a lot of these issues. And I handle probably about, probably about 60 to 70 percent of my practice is uh, female hormone issues. So I have a lot of female hormone um, uh, answers, a lot of advice to give to females, because um, there's not a lot out there. Plus, with all the research that just came out, I mean, it's, it's obvious everybody was doing the wrong thing. <laughs> so I have some good information on that. Um, I'm going to be talking about, um, I talk about Phyto B in there, the Progon B. I got a new product out called Hemestad for females. It's not only for females, it's for men too. Uh, but it's a horse chestnut extract, and you use it for varicose veins, spider veins, spider nevi veins, hemorrhoids. Uh, it's, a, it's a cream. Um, I, I was flipping through the channels. I was flipping through the channels probably about two months ago, and uh, they have like, they had a whole modeling um, program on, um, you know, uh, super moms and all that. And there were some trip, tricks and techniques that, you know, that a lot of people don't know about when those models go out for appearance. And one of those was to use horse chestnut or hemorrhoid cream around the eyes so you don't have baggy eyes to get the fluid, get it out of your face. Okay? It's the same way of getting it out of your face. You can get it out of your legs and stop that from settling. So I introduced that product, so that's available because I didn't really have a lot for uh, hemorrhoids topically. We have a couple things that were, work really well as an astringent to help uh, constrict um, hemorrhoid tissue, but that works directly and it has uh, a, a tremendous uh, track record. Um, so I was flipping through the channels probably about two or three weeks ago and I came across this one program and there was some argumentation and this one um, this one lady said to this older lady, she, you know, she was very ang angry with her, and she said, you know, your bags under your eyes are so big that I could carry groceries in them. And I thought, you know, this is Heem's dad. <laughs> but I was thinking about that in my head. I'm like, wow, that, you know, it wasn't very nice to say, but a lot of times we do hold a lot of fluid. A lot of times we do have a lot of allergic shiners from allergies, from infections, from various things that are just post residue from a lot of these complications. So I'm gonna be talking about that. Balancing sugars, I'm gonna to touch on tonight. Uh, digestion, immune function, toxic world, talking about, uh, you know, everybody knows it's a toxic world out there. I mean, there's so much information, there's so much research. If you haven't seen that lecture, um, I mean, I, tr I tried to sum it together as much as I can. Supporting brain function, <coughs> I mean, most uh, there's a majority of people out there that have, I mean, it's basically, it's, you know, if it's, you're a minority if you're not taking uh, anxiolytic medications, anti-anxiety medications, antidepressant medications, um, seizure medications, all that, all those uh, things. I talk about having specific um, problems with the brain. I talk about using um, l Enzyme Forte if you are going to take those things and that's what you need. There's a protective mechanism you can use uh, for that product and also uh, it can probably keep you off some of those medications. Okay? Um, fighting fatigue. I just went over as many little areas that might, because these, these disease processes are uh, pretty complex. That's why uh, you see uh, contact reflex analysis. It narrows it down. It, it, it brings in my knowledge. It brings in the knowledge of that technique that they've been using for about 45 years. Plus you add blood work, plus you add a hair analysis, and you've got a pretty good uh, defined basis on to work with the patient. You don't need all that, but um, the, the more tools you have, the better off you are. So I go through fighting fatigue. Um, the, I wanted to introduce kind of how I got into this uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty fanatical about nutrition. I love chiropractic. I, I'm a chiropractic patient. Uh, I adjust people. I take care of people's backs and necks. But the, the nutrition in itself has fascinated me also. And it's just as important as uh, anything else. Um, I thought this was kind of interesting because when I talk to friends, when I go to, um, 
you know, functions in, in the subdivision, or I'm just, you know, uh, talking to somebody sitting next to me when we're getting ready to play hockey or something, you know? People don't even know what I do. They, they literally don't, not because they don't know me, but when I say I'm a chiropractor, they don't understand that. Yeah, they think uh, adjustment, um, bad back, bad neck, okay? So <clears throat> I read this through, and this kind of defined why I do what I do. Because it says, a long suppressed US government report assessed 30 million worth of research found that major health problems are related to diet. The solution to illness may be found in nutrition and improved diets. Real potential is that it may defer or modify the development of disease. We already know that it modifies and defers the development of disease. There's plenty of research to prove that. Alexander Shaw is an executive director of the New Citizens for Health organization, which has reprinted the one copy which mysteriously missed confiscation recently surfaced said, the government has known for 21 years that such illnesses as heart disease, many types of cancer, and other serious degenerative diseases can be prevented by diet. Okay? And then it says, it's inexcusable that they have kept this information from the public for all these years. Had this information been made available, we would have knowledge of nutrition to prevent and treat various diseases. The loss of lives and suffering of two generations of citizens denied this information should go down in history as one of the greatest tragedies of modern medicine. So when people say, what do you do? I tell them, <clears throat> I adjust the body structurally and I feed the body nutritionally. Those two simple things. There's a lot of head knowledge that goes behind uh, nutrition and knowing the physiology of the body. And I'm going to give you a sheet up here in probably in about five minutes explaining the metabolism of the cell and what things you actually need to metabolize each thing that you put in your body. So there's no nutrition doesn't belong or the drug, you need this drug to do this. Yeah, in very slim circumstances, but most of the cases, nutrition or the right nutrients or the right enzymes or the right food factors can take care of your problem. Okay, now this brings me back to I've been always trying to find, you know, it's one thing trying to find to offset uh, uh, the birth control pill, but I told most of my females, they say, what can I take? so that um, I don't have uh, symptoms of um, possibly cancer, because birth control pills cause cervical cancer. Um, what can I take to offset the nutritional deficiencies that most of these medications take? So I was recommending in the office, I was recommending uh, uh, TMG, a couple of various products that offset uh, what the birth control pill, uh, pill pushes out of your body that you can't metabolize and lowers your nutritional status. So I'm looking through a bunch of different things, and I added this article because I'm gonna lead up to something here. Working with French International Agency for Research on Cancer, uh, the British epidemiologist uh, reviewed 28 studies that included more than 12,500 women with cervical cancer. They found that the risk was increased 10% in women who used the pill for less than five years compared to women who never used it and 60% for someone who used it for five to nine years and was doubled for 10 years or more, okay? That's pretty serious because the birth control pill and the hormone replacement pill are practically virtually the same thing in the body and how they're metabolized, okay? So 10 years is not an ungodly time for somebody to be on female hormone replacement therapy because the female, the medical doctors get you right when you're cycle, I, oh, I need it for acne or I'm bleeding too much or uh, you know, I don't want to get pregnant or all this stuff. So 10 years, I, some females that came into the office have been on, if you add that, been on for 35, 40 years, okay? These are some of the, uh, these are some of the side effects of oral contraceptives. When you read all of these, it's kind of surprising you're going to get one or two of them. I mean, it's that simple. I mean, you got all these symptoms and your probability goes up the longer the list goes, right? But it says chronic fatigue, increased risk of blood clots, increased risk of stroke, blood pressure, heart attack, cervical dysplasia, that's precancerous tissue, uh, ovarian cysts, infertility, uh, breast, ovarian, uterine cancer, 
uh, your libido's loss, so <clears throat> higher rates of birth defects, birthmarks and offspring, uh, your steroids, you got headaches, your immune dysfunction, your thyroid, your liver, and your cancers your antioxidant levels that help you metabolize certain chemicals out of your body that you come in contact with every day, gallbladder, there's all your nutritional deficiencies that I was covering, some of the females that wanted to make sure they had a good cushion when they took the pill. And then mental and emotional side effects, increased anti-anxiety, antidepressant and sleeping pills, and then it interferes with copper, causes copper toxicity. Now, I found a product which this is the product here from Switzerland, okay? This is the demo product here. This is from Switzerland, and it's called the BioSelf Fertility Indicator, okay? This is the only FDA-approved fertility indicator. It could tell you if you don't want to be pregnant, it tells you, hey, use the, use the, uh, the, the instrument, it'll tell you, when you're fertile, when you're not fertile. If you want to become pregnant, it tells you the right time to become pregnant. Okay? There's a little, this goes by temperature regulation. There's a little memory chip in here. And you, every, when the female wakes up every morning, at the same time, they put it in their mouth for about a minute, it measures their temperature, and that memory chip learns their cycle as they do this over a two to three month period. So it tells you. Here's a red light, here's a green light. We can kind of figure out what that means. Step on the gas is the green light, go, it's the go ahead. When, you, when your temperature is getting that range where you might be ovulating, it will blink. When you are ovulating, it stays red and says stay away, unless you want to get pregnant, okay? So this memory chip learns your cycle over a number of period of times. You know how much the cost of literally the birth control pill is every month? 25 to 30 bucks, around there. This device out of our office is being charged for $165, and only thing you gotta do is change the battery. So, and then after one year, you dial in over the phone, and what happens is, they'll give you a printout of your whole cycle. Every up and every down. So people that have, females that have bad thyroid problems, infertility problems, and then also um, um, uh, this product um, was the only FDA approved, but it's, it's so simplistic. If you can see, here's the chart of ovulation. It goes by the calendar days, plus most of you females that have been following your cycles, you can tell just by cervical mucus. So if you add that with this and have the printout, you don't need birth control. It's 98% accurate. And the advantage to this is, which I talked about probably about a year ago, and I think it's in my female lecture, right now they think that females ovulate three times a month, some of them. That's why even a birth control pill doesn't even work. So this would pick up your ovulation immediately if you do a, a three, Sometimes two, most females are on one, okay? So we're offering this device uh, for females uh, out of the office and uh, that's what it's used for and you don't have to worry about uh, the supplements and it also helps um, offset all the, the, the possible risks from uh, birth control pills. And it's not a lot of work. It's very, very limited and it comes out of uh, Switzerland and we, we get it imported from Montreal. All right, next. All right, let's talk a little bit about glucose. Everybody's got that chart in front of them. Talking about glucose, because, uh, you know, one of the main indicators of uh, uh, glucose is actually your glucose levels in your blood. I mean, this, we're talking about hormone, or uh, we're talking about um, blood levels um, and the different numbers and what they mean. Well, glucose is the main one. It's probably the last thing to show up when you go into the medical doctor and you have sugars that are out of control. Whether they're low or they're high, it's probably the last thing that's gonna show when you're trying to find out if you have diabetes, okay? When it reaches over 126 on the, on the level, you, they're gonna, they're gonna, you're gonna be uh, quoted as having diabetes. You're gonna be tagged and categorized 
you got diabetes now, okay? I'm gonna put you on various medications, do various things. Um, but I wanted to, this, this chart tells us a lot because everybody, you know, um, I think in America, we kind of eat too much. We eat way too much. Um, and, but this, this chart was kind of neat. I, I took this out of, uh, out of one of standard process books on uh, um, reading blood work, but it's, there's, there's almost seven different hormones right there that raise blood sugar. There's only one that lowers it. I thought that was kind of neat. I was like, wow. So that means you're probably better off with less food than how much food we're eating. That's where that whole gluttony thing comes in with people that are eating. And I talk about that because I was watching probably around 10 or 15 years ago, I was watching Saturday Night Live. And how, and how in the olden days, they used to have vomitoriums. And they would eat, and then they would, they would eat, and then they would get a feather, and they would go back, and they'd throw up, and then they'd go back, and they eat, and then they'd get back, and they'd throw up. Okay? Except now, if, if we take that time when they did that and speed it ahead, what disease process do we have? GERD. <laughs> Gastroesophageal reflux without the feather. Literally. So it was kind of interesting in the olden days, but they made a joke of it on Saturday Night Live and all these vomitoriums and all this stuff. So it kind of stuck in my head because I think we eat a lot, of, a lot of different things that we shouldn't eat, and the quantity is a little bit too high. Now, glucose levels should be between 65 and 115. Optimum range is 85 and 100. Uh, when your glucose is increased, that's called diabetes mellitus. Okay? A lot of times when your sugars are increased, uh, your, your thiamine level is, is insufficient. Okay, you'll be tired after you eat. Uh, you'll be fatigued. Um, you might lose a lot of your uh, peripheral circulation. Your hands will be cold because all the blood's being shunted to your gut uh, excessively, especially when you have uh, diabetes. Plus, you'll have fogginess and tiredness and, and, and lack of focus. Um, endocrine. Endocrine hyperfunction, uh, this should be endocrine hypofunction. So I got that wrong on that. Uh, acute and chronic pancreatitis, your pancreas is inflamed. That's the main organ that controls uh, blood sugar. You have insulin that actually gets released when your sugar levels are too high to push it from the blood to the tissue. And when your, your blood sugar is being regulated or you're in a fasting state, you have a hormone called glucagon that actually is released and it raises your sugar levels in your blood, okay? We very seldom use, use glucagon uh, to the levels that we should. Drugs, anabolic and glucocorticoids, epinephrine, norepinephrine, um, these are your water pills, your diuretics, um, Here's your steroids, any uh, growth hormones, anything like that. That could increase your glucose. Stress hormone, obviously it goes with glucocorticoids because once your stress gets high, a lot of times when you're under stress, you're in that sympathetic mode. You're in the go, go, go mode. What happens? Well, your body starts breaking down the proteins in your muscles and your fat, and it pushes it in your blood, get your, your, your energy metabolism up. So you're ready to either fight or you're ready to, to run for it. So uh, that's stress. So cortisol is the main effect uh, that causes your sugar to be high. And there's a lot of people, have everybody seen that commercial Cortislim and all that? Well, those are the people that hold their weight here and, and on their hips and, and, and uh, you know, mostly in the girth area have uh, high cortisol levels. And that's due to stress or not handling stress correctly. Um, and then this is GTF, uh, glucose tolerance factor. That's your chromium and vanadium deficiency. A lot of times when you have a high increased glucose. A lot of females, uh, and not so much men, but a lot of females because of their hormone cycles and, um, and thyroid dysfunction and stuff have decreased uh, glucose levels, which they know because their, their heart gets racy and gets fast and they get sweaty when they don't eat and they feel dizzy. and. They're dizzy when they go from a sitting to a standing position. Um, 
a lot of those things or they just, you know, they blank out or they stare off, stuff like that. That's all blood sugar stuff and that's on the low side of the spectrum. When a lot of times that happens, um, <clears throat> when, when that happens, uh, a lot of times the adrenals aren't talking to the liver correctly or you're waking up in the middle of the night when you shouldn't be waking up. That's when your liver and your adrenals are the most uh, stressed and they're not, they're trying to, you know, it could be you're wrestling in your spirit or something's been bothering you mentally from work or you physically just got done with a, a game or chopping wood or something like that. That would be blood sugar if it wakes you up in the middle of the night. And then free radical pathology, good golly, cancers love carbohydrates. Okay? So they just, they'll just suck. When you've got, a, when you've got a, some type of free radical pathology or tumor or something like that, um, that's the main energy metabolism they love is carbohydrates or sugars. So that will end up being low because they draw it away from the body and use it for the tumor growth. And then uh, liver dysfunction always has to do with uh, um, uh, sugar metabolism. Uh, here's some elevated blood insulin levels. Most people are, are more on the elevated side uh, these days. Um, uh, as you get older, um, you know, in the younger crowd, everybody starts out hypoglycemic, which, which, isn't, which isn't that bad if they just eat the right things, you know. Uh, but then when you start from hypo, when you start getting extremely hypo, then your body has to kick in and start regulating its emergency mode and start keeping your sugars up because it knows it's, it's like a rebound effect to try to keep you from that emergency situation of passing out or going into a coma or anything like that. So a lot of times that's regulatory when your body raises it really high. Here's elevated blood insulin levels. Um, obviously you've got microvascular complications, kidney complications, nerve, high cholesterol, hypertension, atherosclerosis, obesity, and then for females, this polycystic ovary syndrome. You've got many cysts on the ovaries. And actually, um, actually what's happening is with poly, that polycystic ovary, the body's using, uh, the glucose is affecting the maturation of that follicle and stopping it from maturing uh, under some uh, unknown pathway. Uh, finally, uh, heart disease. Um, here's my ad odds with diabetes. Here's your blood pressure, family history. I mean, skin tags. I talked about that in my diabetes like your Skin tags. If you have skin tags, you probably are 80% diabetic. You got diabetes. It's, it's that simple. You got some type of sugar regulation problem. Okay? Skin tag is a little piece of skin that hangs off. They start really small. They're usually found around the neck, underneath the armpits, or in the groin. So a lot of times with, with, with uh, diabetics, you'll see a lot of skin tags, and I see a lot of people coming in with them right through here. And right off the bat, you know the sugar regulation is not, um, is not balanced correctly. And there's a doctor out of Chicago Hospital that did that research and found that in 80% of the people that they kind of uh, tested for insulin, glucose insulin tolerance tests, they had skin tags. So it has something to do with high sugar levels suppression of the immune system, the pushing of viruses, to grow skin tags, okay? Uh, excess weight, low blood sugar. You don't have to excess weight to have diabetes. So don't be fooled because a lot of times when you do have diabetes and you're at those very last levels when your body's just having a tough time uh, managing or regulating it, all of a sudden you're like, God, I lost 50 pounds in three months. Okay, so that's when a lot of times they come in and, and they're tired, they're fatigued, they lost all this weight, they're sweaty. Um, I mean, their sugars, are, their pancreas is just overworked. Here's elevated cholesterol and, and triglycerides, uh, and then uh, male pattern baldness. And that male pattern baldness, a lot of times, um, to touch on that a little bit, a lot of times it has to do with uh, um, uh, the body and uh, insulin levels. The higher your sugar levels are, the lower your growth hormone levels are. So 
when you have male pattern baldness, if your growth hormone levels are gonna be low and your sugar levels are gonna be high, that's gonna suppress testosterone and you're gonna sometimes lose your hair. So there is a hormone relationship to diabetes and male pattern baldness. Uh, here's one on vinegar and blood sugar that we like to uh, use in the office uh, for people to do things on their own. I mean, you can take supplements. There's things you can do on your own that are cheap, that are simple. And one of these things is uh, acetic acid, simple apple cider vinegar. Uh, they gave that to... Um, they gave that to diabetics, tested 30 minutes after a meal, they found that their blood sugar and insulin levels of those who had the vinegar were significantly lower than the placebo group. Overall, 37% improvement in insulin sensitivity. That's just with acetic acid. That's vinegar. It's a real mild acid. So that tells you something about their digestion because if that's happening and apple cider vinegar is a mild acid, I would bet to tell you that most things like GERD and all these, all these acid suppressing medications are affecting and causing high sugar levels. There's some type of relationship there. I know there is because acetic acid wouldn't be doing that well with lowering sugars and insulin sensitivity. So that's why hydrochloric acid is so important in your body. And acetic acid is a little lighter and milder acid. So, uh, you know, that's the first thing you place you want to look on diabetics, and I do, is how their digestion is and if they have enough acid in their stomach. So if you get their acid up just by doing apple cider vinegar or a little bit of stronger ammonium chloride or hydrochloric acid, you might change those numbers a lot quicker and faster, plus put them on a little bit of supplementation so they can absorb this stuff because you can't absorb minerals when you don't have acid in your stomach. So, I mean, there's just a whole pattern that's going on through the body. Yep, hang on here. Let's do it again. Um, now, this is the one test that everybody should really be familiar with. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. This will tell you over a three-month period how you've been doing with your diet. Okay? If, there, if, if, if you've been cheating, um, maybe let's say you're on some medications. If your medications are working, uh, if your supplements are working, this is the test you want to tell every time. Let's say if you're less than seven, let's say you go from... Um, let's say 8% to 7%. 1% decrease on that when you're really high, and I've had people in the office showing 11s and 12s, and their glucose levels are perfectly normal. So their pancreas is really overworking. So, um, but w changing 1% reduces your risk of heart disease by 30 to 40%. Just 1%. Because when you start mixing proteins and sugar together, that's where this hemoglobin A1C tests. When you start mixing those together, uh, that's, that's your brown apple, and you know, that's your rust on metal, and that's, that's your uh, free radical activity. So 120-day forecast of blood sugar control reflects long-term control, allows you to gauge dietary discretion, and the risk of microalbuminuria. Now, I put that in there because a lot of diabetics are coming in the office. Like I said, they have 11s and 12s. It's tough getting a diabetic to take pills in the first place. But when their level is above 8.1% of the hemoglobin, they're blowing proteins out of their kidneys. That means that their kidneys are not responding correctly, and they're going to be probably in dialysis in probably about 5 to 10 years. So anytime you have protein in your urine called microalbumin, you know, you can guess that their kidneys are going to be failing pretty soon. And they already are because your body's supposed to, your, your body's supposed to capture that and take care of that and not allow that to leave. So I put, I put a lot of these females on um, bio-FCTS that stops uh, this particular um, albumin from doing that. And it also helps because when you have a high A1C, a lot of times you have high sugar and cataracts and all kinds of uh, seeing problems. And bio-FCTS from biotics stops um, uh, the sorbitol pathway, the sugar pathway uh, in the eye so that that cataract doesn't progress 
further or get worse. And I put that in pregnancy and fetal risk. I mean, I put that in there because um, I have two kids myself, and my, uh, my wife with our first uh, son had a real difficult time uh, carrying them through the pregnancy, and they wanted to do a, um, um, a glucose tolerance test. And I was like, oh, God. And my wife's hypoglycemic anyway. So um, what happened was I told her, listen, call me whatever test they want to do because I want to make sure that, you know, it will be okay because I know there could be a lot of, you know, slip-ups these days. So uh, she, you know, let it pass. They talked her into doing the glucose tolerance test. And, I mean, she practically passed out. I mean, you're, that's drinking glucose and then checking to see if you're a diabetic during preg pregnancy to see if you have uh, diabetes during pregnancy because now you could swell up with fluid and do all kinds of things. So they did that test with her, and I said, Heather, she, she was all dizzy. She was white as a ghost. I mean, she has a problem with, with her sugar handling. So I said, okay, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Well, uh, you know, that's fine. Let them see what it says. They called two days later. You know what they said? We dropped the vial. You have to come in and do it again. <laughs> and I'm like, you ain't coming in and do that again. Because my kid that's only that big in your stomach doesn't have that much glucose at one time. I mean, that's a lot of glucose at one time for a kid that's developing. So I said, so I, said I, I called up uh, the midwife and I said, uh, I said, we got we to do something different. I said, she's not doing a test again. We know she has a low blood sugar. I know her history, you know, her health history. And they said, oh, okay, we'll take care of that. She came in, and they pricked her finger. They took her blood, blood glucose, and that was it. Why did they do that in the first place? <laughs> or I would have rather they ran this with their blood, took a little bit of blood, ran this test, and would have known exactly how she was doing over that, that pregnancy term. So you live and you learn. Here's my diabetic protocol. Two gymnema. I want to talk about gymnema. Three glucosol, six gataplex GTF. This is usually what I, uh, you know, it varies. And then obviously antifungal support always helps with diabetes because sugar and, and, and fungal and candida and all kinds of problems uh, um, are, are, are troublesome because your sugar is so high in your blood. And then additional, um, I just picked up this pea, pea pod tea. Pea pod tea, I wish you would have brought the label. It's got lima beans, kidney beans, navy beans, string bean. It's got like five different beans in there, and it's known over a long history in Russia that, that it lowers your glucose levels. So I just picked it up out of Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Sue just ordered it last week. I put a couple people on it. Very simple. You make the tea, you let it simmer, it tells you all the instructions. You drink a glass in the morning, you drink a glass at night, and you do that for about two or three months. Instead of drinking your coffee or your colas or your teas, do that tea. Okay? Or your waters or all that stuff. How bad does it taste? <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, the taste on it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, probably having tea with a couple cookies probably wouldn't be a good idea. <laughs> Or just scoop some honey in there or something. <laughs> but, you know, it's, 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 uh, I haven't tasted it yet because I'm not diabetic, but I am going to taste it because we just got it in just to taste it to let people know that. But I haven't tasted it yet. So I'm going to do that, and uh, I'm not going to let people know. <laughs> <laughs> if it's real good, I will, but if it's not. But, you know, considering all the drugs, all the, like, uh, all the complications that happen, I mean, that is just a sure win uh, to, to introduce something that you could do on your own with the apple cider vinegar. I mean, it's a great, great program. Let me show you. Here's the bean pot tea right here. Uh, lowering sugar levels in Russia and Europe for many centuries. Not recommended for anyone with kidney stones, ulcers, that stomach ulcers. I had one lady that had butt ulcers. She said, does that matter? And I said, no. It's stomach ulcers or uh, duodenal ulcers in the small intestine. 
and then obviously low blood sugar. It wouldn't bother you to sit around and have some, some bean pod tea, you know, a glass in the morning or two or three glasses a week. It's not going to lower your blood sugar that much, but consistently over time, it's been known to lower uh, your, your sugar. It could have the potential of lowering at 100 points. Uh, this is bean pod. It's the same thing. Yeah, it's bean pod. Okay. This is this is the product here, but they just uh, there's a couple of different names they go by, but this is the same product. It was just another uh, another name that I picked up. Uh, here's an article. I had uh, um, I had a patient come in um, with uh, the mom, and the kid was eight eight or eight years old, and he had. Uh, type 1 diabetes. He was on insulin and all this stuff and she wanted to know, uh, you know, what we can do for him. She's heard a lot of good things out of the office uh, from what Dr. Tent's been doing and what I've been doing. And um, I pulled this article out for her and I said, listen, if your son's on insulin, the best thing that you want to do is you want to regulate that insulin as strict and as, 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 as precise as you can and that kid, as he develops, because they've known for a long time that if you, they, they've done tests, that if you inject insulin into an artery, it becomes very fatty and a lot of cholesterol and a lot of lipid um, uh, uh, metabolites co congregate in that, in that artery, and it causes, you know, strokes and atherosclerosis and all that. So I went in and I, I told the I said, listen, you know, I'm, you know, a lot of times I'm walking to that office with a lot of faith because, <laughs> you know, people are just so unbelieving these days because of all the things that are going out in the world there. But I told her, I said, I believe if you can stay on that product for six to 30 months, here's the research to tell you that it's going to help you with your glycosylated hemoglobin, your fasting blood glucose, your insulin, your protein levels, triglycerides, all that stuff. But I said to her, I said, Do you, he's only eight years old. He's only had this for a year or two. Maybe those cells are just dormant. Maybe they're not, maybe they're just in shock. And they're still there and they're not being destroyed. I said, this could possibly regenerate his pancreas. Well, you know, what's the next thing that, I, that was asked? Well, why don't the medical doctors do that? I don't know. Ask a medical doctor. I don't know. But I gave her that research, and I said, that's how much you want to take. That's equal to 10 to 13 grams a day of dried leaf for 6 to 30 months. Um, it's not going to interfere. And the good thing about gymnema is even if your blood sugar is low, it's not, or it's not going to affect. It's not going to cause you to pass out or get shaky or put you in a hypoglycemic state. It only works to balance your sugar out, out and also on the high side. So that's the good thing about it. Question. Is that the same gymnema Sylvester, which is used to suppress your desire for sweets? Yes, this, that's the saffins that's in the gymnema. This is the, this is the pill that goes in the stomach. This is not the liquid that goes on the tongue. It's the exact same thing, but the pill works better through the stomach. So if you're trying to suppress sugar cravings or, or stop you know, your craving in your mouth um, psychologically, then that gymnema liquid would work very well before you eat something sugary. <coughs> so these are the tablets, not the liquid. And then here's another uh, there's another study that they found fasting and uh, postprandial is after eating serum insulin levels were elevated in the gymnema group compared with controls taking only conventional <coughs> drugs. Administration of gymnema to healthy volunteers did not produce any acute reduction in fasting blood glucose levels, so everything was normal. So there's some things that we don't understand, but this research was done in 93 and then what they did was they ran this research to back it up in 1990. And this guy, I don't know how you pronounce that, but he's got gas under his arm. <laughs> it's underarm gas. Among a gas under arm. I am not good at pronouncing things. <laughs> okay, let's switch over to the immune system. Um, 
kind of hard not to think about the immune system with all the, the flu shot things going on. And I'll get into that. But, um, you know, the immune system itself is comprised of certain cells, white blood cells. And within those white blood cells, I'm going to go through the different types of cells and how they're responsive. So if you see these cells um, on your blood work that are elevated, most likely, it's under, if it's under increased or decreased, you're gonna sh it's gonna show why it's that way under this chart. Here's the different white blood cells in your, uh, in your body. Tells you the, uh, the, the optimum range. Uh, this is happening again. Um, but basically, you have your, they call them granulocytes. You have neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Um, I'll talk about each one of those, except the basophils. Everybody knows what the basophils are. I know you know it, because that's the one where you release all the uh, bradykinins, histamines, allergy, mast cells, all that stuff. So when you test for basophils, a lot of times you're testing for uh, um, an allergy to something, whether it's a protein in your food, or it's a piece of dust, or it's a cockroach, or whatever it might be. Um, then you have lymphocytes and monocytes, and they just granulate them, how they granulate or come together uh, through, a, um, through a, a, a dying effect. They actually dye the cells. Okay, white blood cells, the main part of your immune system, are made up of those uh, six specific areas. Uh, most of the time, obviously, white blood cells are, anytime you have an infection, um, different specific cells go to that uh, specific area depending on what's causing the infection. Whether it's fungal, whether it's candida, whether it's viral, whether it's, um, 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 whether it's uh, bacterial, there's a bunch of different things that could happen with this, with those. I called on this thing, and they said that the, you know, I need to change the battery. <laughs> so, that was the advice. Um, just have to use this. So, adrenal dysfunction, a lot of times your white blood cells, your adrenals create cortisol. Cortisol is a good hormone, you know, at the right levels in your body. So, you need cortisol to uh, get your immune system going. That's why when you have a... a, a you know, some type of organ transplant. Those are, those are cortisol inhibitors or corticosteroid inhibitors so that your body doesn't reject the organ transplant and all that. But that has to do with adrenal uh, dysfunction. Uh, asthma, uh, every asthmatic has adrenal dysfunction. Uh, possible late pregnancy and leukemia. A lot of times leukemia will raise those white blood cells. Um, decreases in white blood cells. Here we go with the vitamin and mineral deficiencies. Um, I'll go through that, but you got adrenal dysfunction again, a lot of times hepatitis, when those, those white blood cells are working overtime, and there's a chronic inflammation, that will draw the level down. That's why it's, it showed a, a decreased. Your thyroid's working too hard, probably hyperparathyroidism. Hyperparathyroidism is when you have um, the parathyroid hormone that releases parathyroid, that raises calcium levels in the body. And your body's main uh, um, that's your body's main mineral, that's the fever mineral. Calcium is a fever mineral to quench fevers and also to um, initiate um, some certain cells to go and eat um, various things that are foreign to the body. And that's called phagocytes or phagocytic activity. So in the olden days, medical doctors, when you brought your kid in and he was running a fever, a lot of times, you can give him a Tylenol or you can give him acetaminophen or something to suppress his fever. A lot of times what they did was they dipped him in warm water because warm water gets the metabolism going and it turns over to bone calcium so you can handle the fever correctly. So a lot of these kids that come in they have these real high fevers and their joints ache and there's growing pains and all these various things. We give them the calcium lactate because it's the it's the, it's the best mineral to give for an infection because if you run out of your, your, your calcium, your body's going to burn it in your bones. It's that simple. And calcium is very important. It's just kind of obvious because of also sugar regulation. Your body needs right calcium levels for you to regulate sugar in your pancreas. So a lot of times 
Um, I know other practitioners, I don't really look at that, but I know uh, why they're doing what they're doing. But a lot of times they'll check your calcium magnesium levels in your hair to see how your sugar metabolizes. Your sh if your calcium is really high, your sugar, you're not handling your sugars very well. Okay, so that is a, a hair analysis indicator. Uh, so rheumatoid arthritis, white blood cells, something's irritating the joints, uh, whatever it may be. Um, and then uh, the flu, influenza, and then um, uh, lupus, systemic lupus erythematosus, so just lupus, the werewolf sign. Lymphocytes, these are, these are um, a specific type of white blood cell under white blood cells, which are called lymphocytes. They also call them, uh, um, you know, leukocytes uh, for white. But it says that lymphocytes react to toxic uh, byproducts of protein metabolism. They originate from the erythroblasts or the, the, blood, the bloods of spleen, tonsils, thymus, and bone marrow. So that's where lymphocytes mostly are. That's why you have swelling in your tonsils. You've got a big mesh around your neck of lymph nodes. And that's the lymphatic system, and that's mostly spleen, tonsils, thymus, and, and bone marrow. Those are where most of that infection is being, being held or trying to be neutralized and be fought. Uh, lymphocytes increased infection. You have stress can cause that. Radiation, people that fly a lot are exposed to a lot of radiation, you know, uh, flying, you know, once a week for a long time. That's a lot of radiation exposure close outside of that atmosphere. So, you know, people are wondering, God, why am I, you know, it could be you're flying too much. Because that's not normal to fly that high. <laughs> radiation, lead poisoning, uh, food intolerance, and chronic toxic accumulation. Now, this goes in, into effect because with lymphocytes with rheumatoid arthritis. I see a lot of people that have lymphocytes that will be high, and then when I look at it, and you look up there and it says protein metabolism, that's uric acid. So a lot of these people that have uric acid that are high and also have high lymphocytes are those people that have gout. And so what does the body do when you have gout in high levels? It brings the lymphocytes to go and clean up all the, the gout and the uric acid and all that and to clean up infection because anytime you damage tissue, there's infection in the body. It's just that your resistance is lower. So those lymphocytes go to that area and then now, God, it looks like I got osteoarthritis there or it looks like I got a pain in my toe or, or whatever. So you got a, you know, uh, an inflammation in your big toe which is a cardinal sign for gout or your other joints are bothering you. So you can test on, uh, for uric acid also and match those two up and see how bad rheumatoid arthritis is or any other osteoarthritis is. Oh, let's use this. Oh, oh, no, don't do that. No, no, no. Um, the next one is um, neutrophils, which are very, very important because the fact I just touched on for diabetes, uh, neutrophils are suppressed under, um, neutrophils are suppressed by 70% um, when your sugars are high. So um, that's your main, um, that's your main white blood cell category, not a lymphocyte. There's lymphocytes, neutrophils, but those are all under white blood cells. Neutrophils go after more uh, bacterial. And there's your phagocytosis where the, where the cells actually go and surround the, 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 the antigen or something that's foreign to the body. So that's phagocytosis. Um, a, a lot of times with neutrophils um, and having high sugar levels, those will be suppressed, so you'll have a tough time fighting infection or you'll pick up infection chronically or um, you'll end up with uh, a fungus on your toes or your nails. Um, that's all because of uh, uh, neutrophils or you'll end up with an upper respiratory or bacterial pneumonia or something. That's because the neutrophils are being uh, suppressed. Um, these are probably the most active cells in the body. So, you know, uh, probably I would say maybe one, one 
tablespoon of sugar, which is three teaspoons of sugar a day, would be enough to suppress your immune system by 50, 60%. So that's how important it regulates your sugar levels in your body are. Um, inflammation will cause high levels, uh, emotional or physical stress, hypersensitivity reactions, that's um, you know peanut allergies, mold allergies, um, banana allergies, whatever. Uremia is just, uh, has to do with the uh, urine, urine, blood and urine. Newborn, um, a lot of times we'll have eye neutrophils because they're entering an environment that's very uh, infectious and that baby's immune system was relying on the mother's immune system. And then UV light, cold stress, and heat. Decreased chronic infection, bone marrow depression, lupus, and then Here's all your iron, vitamin B12, B6, folic acid, anemias that, are, that will uh, d uh, decrease your neutrophil levels. That's very, very important for mineral levels and for uh, nutrition. And then heavy metals. Dr. Krieger? Yeah. When you get a blood test on those neutrophils, how is that indicated on the blood result? On the neutrophils? Yeah. Yeah, is there a... Uh, there's there's going to be um, it's percent and absolute. It's going to I'll show you. It's up at the top here. It's going to show you up here. It's going to be optimal range is 50 to 60 percent, and then your reference range is 40 to 75 percent. I don't think he got what, what cat is on it. It's under white blood cells. Just the white blood cells. Two of them. There's absolute and there's uh, total on it. Yeah, the total percentage is what you want. And that would be those between 40 and 74. And there's, I mean, there's, there's other ways of breaking this down even further. This is, this is you know, pretty general. Um, here's the cinephils. Um, a lot of times with these cinephils, it's got to be the reference range is 0 to 6%. Optimal range is 0 to 3% of the white blood cells. Um, this happens a lot of times in allergic diseases, systemic infection, fungal infections. These are your kind of your, uh, your hypersensitivity things, your pinworms, your hookworms. Um, a lot of uh, parasite infestation has to do with these cinephils. And I think this is a major thing uh, that's, that's, that's overlooked in, um, in medicine these days because they just don't know what to look for as far as parasites. So all those skin disorders. So if you're, you're looking at skin disorder, fungal, and you show it high on eosinophils and it ends up not being parasites, your, your immune system's probably wired a little bit differently than somebody else's because we know that there are certain people that have uh, different reactions when they have vaccines uh, or, or handling infections or food intolerances or allergies. So there are certain things you, you would never want to do um, if you disregarded a couple of these things, because you know you probably want to watch your food proteins very, very uh, carefully. Your your milk products, your wheat products, those things is when you start digging into your foods and finding out what type of allergens uh, are really creating this. Um, even a, a pH problem could cause a lot of these allergic diseases or systemic infections, because as we saw. Uh, um, um, as we saw, parasitic uh, or parasite infestation has to go, you know, it doesn't go up into the rectum and go up into the colon and sit there and multiply and all that or go up in the small. It goes in through the mouth. Okay? So your first line of defense is your hydrochloric acid levels and making sure that's, that's adequate. So the people that are getting chronically reinfected, their pH levels are way, way off. Okay, let's keep on going here. Now, let's talk a little bit. I, somebody brought this in probably about two years ago. So I wanted to talk about the flu shot. And I, they, were, they were having, this was at a grocery store in, in Florida. And um, I started reading this and um, I knew I, I didn't want to get a flu shot. It's that simple. Uh, it said you have to be over the age, over uh, 18 years of age, be free of neurological disorders. That's uh, multiple sclerosis, and that's Guillain-Barré syndrome. Guillain-Barré syndrome is when something attacks your uh, 
your, your, your nerves in your low part of your back where your sacrum is. You end up being in a wheelchair or can't walk. Uh, the flu shot can cause that or aggravate it if you have it from some other reason. It, uh, uh, no, it hasn't. It's one of the side effects of a flu shot. That I've done, because I have CIDP, mm -hmm. says that it has not been proven. That it is suggested that GPS and CIDP. It's a possibility that it could cause it, is that correct? Is there a possibility that. Very low percentage. Okay. I mean, well, they don't think it's possible. I can definitely give you some information if you, uh, uh, from the research, if you want to. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. everything I talk about up here, if you don't understand it or anything, I can give you a reference for it so that I'm not just talking generally, okay? So I can give you a couple references and the, um, 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 I'm trying to think the National, I think it's the National Science Institute had a big, fat, thick book on all immunizations and all the possible reactions that could occur, okay? And the, and the Something in it, or it could be from the allergy, or it could be from the mercury, or it could be itself from the virus that's in there. Oh, okay. So anything that's going to create inflammation, whether it's in the brain, if it's in the spinal column, in the sacrum, it's called gillian barre syndrome. If it's up in the brain, it's called meningitis. It's all the same thing. It just depends where it goes in the body or how it gets into that part of the body. If, what about it? That's not in the spine. That's not in the brain. What it's affecting the nerves. What do you mean, the CI? Chronic inflammatory demyelinating coming around. Well, that's, that's, well, that has to do with, that, that's similar to multiple sclerosis. Well, it's not exactly, but so, it's in a category similar to that. Yeah, I mean, there are demyelination problems, but that's having to do with the uh, myelin sheath and the insulin growth factor one having to do with myelin. And, and the growth in the brain. And that has to do with the mercury toxicity in the, in the flu shot. So the, the flu shot without the thing or so. Yeah, that's not going to happen in America, though. I doubt it last year. It's, it's not going to happen because they can't take it out. Because they need to replace it with another preservative. They just lowered the, the dosage. They never took it out. Oh, they said they took it out. Yeah, they didn't take it out. So if you want to see the research on that, I'll give you that, too. Yes. Um, but these not being, not suffering from active infection, not having an allergy to eggs, not, there's your thimerosal, which is your mercury derivative, and then uh, genomycin or other aminoglycosides, something else. Now, I got this article off of um, Ivanhoe. It was Ivanhoe Broadcast News in 2000, and it said, researchers found that mice that consumed a diet with inadequate amounts of selenium developed substantially more harmful lung inflammation those mice that were fed a normal diet. The inflammation also lasted significantly longer in the selenium deficient mice than their selenium fed counterparts. So when their selenium levels were high enough and they were in the normal status range, they recuperated quicker and faster. Okay, so nutritional deficiencies have a lot uh, to do on um, how you uh, rebound from, from infection. So taking somebody that's uh, selenium deficient or uh, somebody that has low nutritional status and giving them a flu shot, uh, I don't think, uh, I think that's, that, that's the wrong idea. That's not supportive of uh, the immune system, even though I know what the theory is. So that's the research that showed on that. It's interesting because selenium and mercury have a very strong relationship. When you raise selenium in the body, you displace mercury in the body. And that's what they're finding. So in this situation, um, if you get the shot and there is mercury in the shot, mercury displaces selenium in the body because selenium likes to find the thyroid gland, the brain, the abdominal aorta, and the kidneys. So, and the, probably the biggest need for selenium probably in the whole part of the body is the heart muscle or the abdominal aorta. I'm sorry, the, uh, uh, the um, yeah, the aorta. 
So that's where they found the highest levels for people that had uh, mercury from whatever various reasons. Here's an article that um, Mr. Nunes gave me. He brought this in the other day. I'm, I'm looking at this. Nobody in their right mind can convince me that any, there's any safe dose of mercury in anything. It says that there has been widespread concern that mercury-based preservatives used in vaccines might impair neurological development in children, but the opposite seems to be true. Im immunized infants with vaccines contain the preservative thimerosal may actually be associated with improved behavior and mental performance. That's absolutely impossible to prove. According to two British studies published in the Medical Journal of Pediatrics, and then um, it goes over containing, uh, they, they just talk about the different things, but basically, your, uh, what was the name of that, that disease that you mentioned? Yeah. That has to do with, that's a neurological disease, correct? Okay, so here's the behavior for fine motor uh, skills, for speech, for tics, and for special education. Most of that stuff is neurologically controlled. <clears throat> so they found instead of finding the outcomes were worse with increasing exposure to thimerosal, the authors showed less hot hyperactivity and and conduct problems at 47 months and better motor development at six months and 30 months and reduce difficulties with sounds and need for speech therapy. Dr. McColl, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Dr. McColl, he's got an excellent website on this. He's got all the facts presented. He shows that at, at the time they were using, um, they were using almost 40 fold what they should have been using in, in these vaccines. And now they dropped it down 40-fold. Right now, a flu shot contains 25 micrograms of mercury. The EPA only allows one microgram. And this is a comment by Mr. Funnenberg, MD, the world's leading immunogeneticist. He's got 850 papers published, and he says, listen, mercury is a brain toxin. If you get five shot, consecutive flu shots between 70 and 80, you have 10 times the odds of getting Alzheimer's disease as a person who has had two flu shots or less. What are we promoting here by getting everybody getting a flu shot here? Um, I'll have to get you that. I'll have to get you that. Oh, yeah, Dr. McCullough. So there's a lot of good information. Now, whenever, whenever you look at, I put this scenery up here because we're talking about flu season, it's the fall. What's probably your best thing right now against the flu that you can get out of nature? It's all those colors. What are those colors? Bioflavonoids. Those are flavonoids the pigments in those colors, that right now, um, at one of the cancer institutes right now, they're using flavonoids for certain types of viruses in breast cancer. Flavonoids increase white blood cell count. They increase phagocytic count. They increase epinephrine, cortisol levels. So the best thing you could be doing is getting certain flavonoids. I'm not going to go into the ones, the specific ones, but when you look out, yes, there's no chlorophyll there because there's no photosynthesis there. There's no light meeting carbon dioxide, so it loses the green. And that's how you get the, the, the fall colors. That's what's underneath the green. But those are the flavonoids that you're looking at to fight a flu or to get over a, a, a flu you know, uh, issue. That's what you want. No. <laughs> the, the, probably the biggest thing that we use to, um, for prevention or support when you have a flu issue is the Ceruta Plus or the BioFCTS. 
that's probably the best pill that you can use. That's the flavonoids that come from buckwheat. Buckwheat has the highest uh, amount of bioflavonoids that you can get. Um, uh, and plus it has the vitamin C complex, not the vitamin C. We're talking about the complex here with the flavonoids, the copper, the tyrosinase, the whole complex. That's Ceruta Plus. That's what we use, and we also use the BioFCTS, which is uh, very similar to that. And that's, what, that's the one that has all the flavonoids in it. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about natural killer cells are very important in the body. They're probably the most primitive cells in your body as far as for uh, um, whether it's a, a, a flu, whether it's a bacteria, whether it's a fungal, toxicity. Natural killer cells are the most primitive cells that are at, at the site when something happens specifically in an acute phase of, of whatever you know, uh, occurs. That's probably the most important, simplistic way to raise your immune system, especially during the flu season, or if you have a, a long history of um, um, working with paints, working in hardware stores, working at the Home Depot in the, in the, uh, in the home and garden section with all those smells, um, in a salon, a beauty salon, uh, with, with, with all those different uh, chlorines. Um, there's a bunch of different things that this is good for. Maybe you have a propensity to smoke. And you you know, got to offset something. But natural killer cells, the best way to get that up, they found with fe females that had uh, uh, breast cancer, th those were the ones with the lowest had the highest rate of cancer cells going from one area of the body to the next area, and that's called metastasizing. Not that it's going to you know, cure your cancer, but it's going to put your immune system in a good position to fight the cancer off or to stop it and localize that, that specific thing. So natural killer cells are the main ones you want uh, while you're going specifically through this uh, season. And there's a good way to get your natural killer cells up with IAG. It stands for isolated arabinogalactin, and it's a sugar fiber from a tree. Um, <clears throat> how this works is they're using this a lot. Uh, they, all the research is on this has been five or seven years ago. There's a product out there called MGN3. It's very similar to this product, but they're all done now because of, you know, some of the claims they came out with in the FDA. Yes? It's an interesting story about MGN3 that they just took off the market. Yes. My husband and I use it, and we had a cat that was very sick and couldn't keep food down. And he had a growth on his esophagus and his heart mm -hmm. at the size of a golf ball. They showed us the x-rays. The doctor said they could operate on him. But we took him home and we gave him MGN3. He got better almost immediately. With three months, we took him back for something else. We asked him if he'd x-ray him again and we wanted to see how the tumor was doing. Sure. He was surprised he didn't live that long. The tumor had been reduced to the size of a, of a pea. He couldn't mm -hmm. believe it. Neither could we like that, which is fantastic. I believe it. I absolutely believe it. He said he's going to buy some for himself. But you can, I mean, you have fun getting it now because they've been, they've been closed down. Um, and the doctor then talked about this last lecture. But these are some of the things, but IAG is that, that product, that, that the sugar molecule that helps raise natural killer cells. If you did that for the first week, you would raise your natural killer cells about 1.6 times. If you did that over a two to four week period, you'd raise them eight times. If you did that over a three month period, it's shown through blood tests and analysis that you raise your natural killer cells 28 times. If you keep it up for over a three to four month period, okay? One of the biggest things that you see out there with people that are treating any type of immune dysfunction or any type of free radical pathology or anything like that, they're testing their natural killer cells. If they're high, you got a good chance of pulling through. If they're low, you got to do something very quickly to get those up. Because you do not want to lose those primitive cells. And that's what I'd be using for the flu. Why do you think they took the MG and 3 off the market? I don't, you know what? I, I'll, I'd love to talk to you after about that. It's just, you know. Here's what I just explained here on the uh, 27 times more cancer cells than they were prior to taking IAG. Here's the research and um, some of the things it does for uh, immune system. Uh, cholesterol, cholesterol is 
bad for you, right? I guess. But cholesterol is important for our body. Our diet is proper function and structure of cell membranes and bile acids. That's an awful color for a slide. But bile is mostly green. That's why I picked that. <laughs> uh, the, the liver, adrenal, sex glands, intestines, and even placenta manufacture cholesterol. And cholesterol is best used as an indicator of other metabolic dysfunctions. Cholesterol itself is not a good indicator of metabolic dysfunction. Nothing is itself. And people are relying on the Mevacors and the Zocors and all those things when they have a little bit of a high LDL raising their cholesterol at 230 or 240. That should not be an issue for somebody that's healthy and all their other blood, blood parameters, their triglycerides, their HDLs, um, uh, their ratio, um, their sugar levels, that should not even be an issue. And, and, it, and it really is sad. It's, it's overuse of medication. That's what it is. And I've seen probably about three months ago, maybe it was, it was sooner, on the Channel 4 News, they had a story on, on all the, those statin drugs. They had a guy that was a CEO of a company taking one of the statin drugs for two to three months, and he went, he can't even balance his checkbook now. They talked about it right on the news. That's how bad, that's how lethargic, it slowed down his brain, his muscle function, his neurological function, all that. And you do not feel good taking Mevacor, Zocor, Lipitor. You can't because it interferes with cholesterol metabolism and serotonin. So the next thing they're gonna probably wanna give you is some Prozac, because you're not gonna be able to make uh, or, uh, serotonin from cholesterol, because you don't have any, or it's too low, okay? Cholesterol is best used as an indicator of other metabolic functions. It should not be considered a disease by itself unless extreme, which suggests some type of familial or family problem there. And that Framingham study, I don't think, um, when they did that study, I don't think they took out all the familial cholesterol problems. So it made it look like, wow, all these people have cholesterol, and, and now it's better. You gotta, you gotta, when you do a study, you got you to gotta take out those variables so it's a plausible study. Uh, here's your reference range, 130 to 220. I think optimal range is 185 to 200. I don't mind 230, 240, because that's what it used to be a long time ago um, for various reasons. And there's a lot of you know, older people still living. Increased diet, high in refined carbohydrates can r rise. Hypothyroid, because you can't get the lipids out of your blood, so your cholesterol gets a little bit higher. That's a false, that's a false positive uh, uh, or false negative for cholesterol because it's high because of uh, endocrine dysfunction. Your thyroid is not working as fast. It's not, it's not creating um, as much energy. Then you got your pancreas, uh, renal. You got your familial stuff, pregnancy, insulin. There's the insulin and cholesterol relationship. And then uh, uh, steroids uh, can really monkey with that. Now, it's interesting to see, because when you start playing with your cholesterols and trying to get that in the right range, even at 130, I mean, people are just full of infection out there. They, they truly are. And the best way, most of these infections are anaerobic. The best way to raise your oxygen level in your blood and to push more oxygen to the site so you can burn up these infections and the immune system can use them is by raising your cholesterol level. That's why herpes zoster burns up cholesterol very quickly. Infection. Malabsorption, there's free radical. If you got real low cholesterol, you probably got a free radical. Unless you got one of these others, but mostly it's free radical. And that's why they're going after those, those main things. They're thinking, oh, cancer, everybody. Cancer, everybody get on this stuff. Cancer, everybody. Well, that's why. Various free radical pathologies decrease cholesterol. Depression and then malignancies. Let's keep on going here. Here's your HDLs. HDLs, you know, if you're carrying more away from the site for your body to get it out of the body, uh, it's better if you're carrying less from your liver to your tissues or wherever it's taking it. Uh, uh, if it's lower, that's better. 
So, uh, you know, it's just a transport. It's just a transport issue when you're talking about HDLs and their levels. Um, but it's very common to see somebody with really, really high levels. Um, if you have uh, bad HDLs, obviously you don't just look at the HDLs. You've got to look at the triglycerides, your uric acid, and your other levels, too, to see a picture. Okay, you just don't draw a head and then walk away and say, you know, that's a face. It's not a face. It's a eh. Where's the, where's the eyes and the mouth and the nose and everything else? So combined other markers, that's what you want to do to check for triglycerides, cholesterol, and then to reduce the HDLs and atherogenic. So if you've got all those, you might be blocking up uh, in your arteries or filling up. Here's um, increased, I'm going to go over increased, decreased diets high in saturated fat, poor fat utilization, lack of exercise, uh, your triglycerides are too high, your liver's not working, maybe you got hepatitis, um, maybe you got fatty liver disease. Um, and it's kind of neat because they're coming out with that non-fatty liver disease right now, or it's called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Okay? And a lot of the times these people would go and show a fatty liver and they go to the medical doctor and they do a biopsy and say, yeah, you got too much fat, you've been drinking too much. Well, they know now that there's some type of genetic discrepancy in the liver, and it's not the alcohol causing it. Okay? So we had one, uh, um, one uh, employee in the office whose mother got dismissed because of that issue. Oh, you're drinking. You know. No, I'm not. <laughs> so now they've... They've branded non-fatty liver disease for a genetic problem. Obesity, here's some, um, those could be asthma medications, those could be steroids, those could be a lot of different things. Those could be um, anything with histamine or epinephrine or norepinephrine, genetic and then diabetes. Let's get into these. LDLs are very important because I talked about that last time, how uh, a lot of times just, just the simple... Uh, uh, fructose um, fruit sugar can raise your LDL levels if you, your body can't metabolize it correctly. Now I want to hand out this sheet here. If you guys can just take one and hand out, because when somebody this this actually came out of uh, a chemistry book. There's a doctor, uh, Dr. Lang. I can't remember what particular uh, state. Uh, she practices in, but she's, you know, I mean, she's got a, a considerable practice. She's helping out a lot of people. I've been to a number of her lectures, and um, she, she dug up all this information, this material. So she's referenced on the bottom there. But that's what goes on in your body metabolically um, when you don't have, when you don't have the right nutrients, vitamins, minerals, essential fats, all that stuff. This is, what, this is what goes wrong. And you will not find this in a chemistry book probably ever again. This, this was in an old, old chemistry book. Because when I went to school and I studied biochemistry, I never saw any of this stuff. They named it real weird names. NAD, RAD, FAD. I mean, that's a, a hiding stuff. FAD has to do with... Uh, you know, uh, riboflavin, your or NED has to do with niacine levels. I didn't know all that in biochemistry. You just got all these. It doesn't even make sense. So, but diabetes uh, can raise that. We just talked about alcoholism. Another one, uh, chronic kidney disease, pancreas, gout can cause that. Here's a glycogen storage disease that we have to worry about. Uh, LDLs can be decreased in liver biliary, hyperthyroid. Your thyroid's running too fast. Depression. Why LDL depression? Because you don't have cholesterol. There's your serotonin. Anemias, malabsorption, cardiac dysfunction. Let's keep on going here. Here's some news on genetic high cholesterol. April 30th, 2001. If high cholesterol runs in your family, it may not mean you, need, you meet a premature death, says researchers. I found this article, and they examined 200 years. I've never seen a longer 
epidemiological study or grabbing information, over 200 years of birth, marriage, and death certificates in a family with the history of high cholesterol, where cholesterol runs high in the family. Researchers found about 40% of family members in this high cholesterol family lived normal lifespans. What's a normal lifespan? 80, 75, 80, what is it, 76.3 or something? I don't know, something. But, you know, 80, pretty good. During the first 100 years, researchers found family members were apt to live longer than the average population. Early death rates started increasing in 1950 with a peak in the ni or 1915 and a peak in 1950s. The life expectancy of members have been increasing. Researchers also say death rates varied from branch to branch of the family tree. So the conclusions we are coming to now do not match the research that was done. So that means that, <laughs> that, that means that they're being exaggerated. Authors of a study suggested the Y variation in risk could be due to environmental factors such as diet and smoking. They say future research is needed to identify which patients are extreme risk of premature death and which environmental factors can increase or decrease this risk factor. Let's keep on going here. Let's back that up. Uh, triglycerides um, should be between a normal range of 30 and 150. Optimal range is 75 to 100. Anything under 150 um, would be fine. Um, the best way probably, that, which I'm going to talk about to lower triglycerides, is a lot of times just fish oil. About four or five grams of fish oil. And um, there's a little bit of niacin, a little bit of polycot. There's, a, there's some other things you want to add to that, but, I mean, just fish oil itself has been known to really lower triglyceride levels and sensitize insulin so that insulin isn't pushing more fats to make three glycerol or three fat molecules. So that's, a, that's what that means. But there could be genetic uh, diabetes, insulin resistance. Here's your alcoholism, your pancreatitis. This is kind of cool. I found in 75% of patients, gout had high triglyceride levels. So what does this mean? When I talked about my immune system and my, um, I think it was uh, digestion and immune system, I mentioned that when you raise hydrochloric acid levels, you lower uric acid levels. So drinking alkalized water does not do that. Taking hydrochloric acid lowers uric acid levels. Why is that? Well, gout is found in 75% of patients. What's gout? Abnormal protein metabolism. You're not digesting your proteins. You don't have enough hydrochloric acid for whatever reason. So high triglycerides is a direct reflection of faulty digestion. Uh, it's going to be obviously decreased if your body's in a state of go, 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 because it's going to turn them over quicker. Um, oral contraceptives will raise triglycerides uh, after a meal containing fat, excess fructose, and then you're not exercising. My end, mine ended up being high because I wasn't exercising. Maybe a couple of those Twizzlers and popcorn, but I was, you know, I went from a hockey playing every day for two to three hours to, uh, you know, doing this work, trying to help people, and I only play once, once a week now. So my triglycerides went way up because my body was used to burning all that. I was kind of stuck in that mode. Now it's stuck in the other mode. i got to get it out. Uh, here's your fat metabolism. Um, you know, that, that garlic, that meta-herb garlic that we have is probably one, one tablet of that is equal to 10 cloves. So you're getting about 20 cloves of garlic just in that two meta herb um, tablets right there. That's enough in itself to lower your cholesterol, your triglycerides, and to raise sulfa um, proteins in your blood so you can handle infections uh, a little bit better. The PCOH plus, you want to take that with food because of the niacin, that helps with triglycerides. These four things is what I would rely on in place of uh, other things that, 
that, that the medical community brings forward. Or the fish oil too. But fish oil I think would be a little bit better than flax, so you're right on that. Now red blood cells, I'm, um, I was doing a little research and I came across, you know, there's a lot of females that are low normal in America. You know, their hematocrits, low normal. Their hemoglobin is a little no, low normal. Their ferritin level is a little low normal. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, you know, it's tough convincing somebody because blood work is supposedly very objective. I mean, it is. It's getting better and better. But um, if I see it low normal, a lot of people, well, that's perfectly fine. I don't need to see the doctor for anything. It's, it, everything's fine. Well, a lot of times in low normal, I found doing some research that everybody, anybody has heard of that fifth disease? If anybody has ever been exposed to fifth disease when they were a kid or an adult or for whatever reason or however they picked that little virus up, fifth disease lowers your right blood cells, your iron levels, genetically, because it damages that part of your genes. So that's what they found. So in fist disease, if somebody's running a real low normal, it's probably because of immune dysfunction from some type of previous virus, possibly that one, because they know that young girls and young guys that have that disease run a really low ferritin level or a low iron level. So that damaged some a part of the body. So if you find that you have a low normal on your red blood cell. I didn't put the hematocrit up here. I didn't put the ferritin. But you might want to do something for your immune system. And you might want to support yourself with, with iron because your body's not going to be able to keep up those stores if you're genetically incapacitated by 30 40%. So you might need to stay on iron the rest of your life. Not ferrous sulfate that, that's in, you know, the, the, I'm trying to change up my analogies. The, the, you know, the rim of my bike tire. <laughs> yes. Can a previous staph infection cause a decrease in the red blood cell count? Yes. Absolutely. Especially strep. Strep can cause it. Staph can cause it. Anything can cause it because your body's going to mobilize iron to help with oxidation and help push the immune system. So you can have increased levels if you're up in the mountains and you don't have enough oxygen. Your body has to produce red blood cells to offset that. Uh, respiratory distress, maybe uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease where your um, uh, pulmonary arteries, uh, maybe from smoking or um, cystic fibrosis or something like that. Essential hypertension. We don't know why your hypertension's messed up, but red blood cells a lot of times are uh, increased. Um, iron anemia decreases that, vitamin B12, vitamin B6, and folic acid. So any one of those deficiencies, they could overlap each other and cause uh, red blood cells to be low. Let's keep on going. Liver enzymes, just to go over these real quick. You know, you really need to destroy your liver about 50 to 60% in order for you to have real liver failure. I mean, when people walk into the office and say, oh my goodness, my liver enzymes are high. They've probably been high for a little while. And this probably, a lot of times, uh, for instance, uh, uh, with, the, with the kidneys also, the kidneys can handle a lot, the liver can handle a lot. But when you start showing liver enzymes, you're, you're starting to show backup or excessive amount of enzyme use to get something taken care of, like a hepatitis or a drug that's in your liver or anything. That, there's, a, there's a huge gap there between when you have high liver enzymes and when you have high kidney problems uh, than just subclinical. It's tough to pick up a subclinical liver uh, problem or a subclinical kidney problem. And that's why the CRA change in energy pattern in the kidney a lot of times will tell you because you have to damage your kidneys 60% before it shows up on your blood work. It's too late most of the time. So... People say, well, he's subclinical. How do I know? Well, he's been doing the research for 45 years. If your reflex is active on your kidney, you've got a problem with your kidney. It's that simple. 
Uh, here's some of the liver enzymes, things that can cause that skeletal muscle uh, injury. That's from taking statin drugs, can go after the skeletal muscles. That could be uh, any type of viruses go after the muscles. That's why you feel tired and fatigued. Um, and then heparin therapy. Oh, the, and a decrease in that vitamin uh, B6. And everybody have this, uh, this sheet here? Just to go over it real quick on the pathways of metabolism in the cell. I mean, B6, all your B vitamins are huge. So when people come in, they got depression, they got all these problems. You wonder why we put them on that, 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 that food concentrate cataplex B, which has the thiamine, the B6, the B12. It's got everything in there because this is what we're supporting. Um, if your body, we like to use that cataplex B, especially because along this B pathway, the B2s, the B1s, the B6s, and the B3s on that cataplex B, your brain's going to get the best, uh, uh, um, probably the biggest assault if you don't have good metabolism in your body. Your brain, because you, your brain's going to get excitatory when it doesn't have enough sugar. And then you start having trouble. And then your, your heart starts pounding because it starts putting more blood because your body wants energy. So when you can't metabolize your carbohydrates or you're missing these type of things, your brain tends to get hyper-excitatory, not hypo doesn't relax when you're missing these things. It gets excitatory. That's where your cravings are. That's where your anxiety is. That's where your depression is. And that's why from that first column, we use the cataplex B. For people that have anxiety, irritability, worry, all that stuff. And then the rest, lipids. You need all these, you need all, to, to do your fats, your cholesterol, your triglycerides, you need to follow all that column there. You need all those nutrients along that pathway. If you're taking the birth control pill, you're probably messing with these two pathways here where the acetylcholine, choline, the folate, and the B12, you start messing with that pathway, you can have high triglycerides. That's why any drugs that disrupt any of these pathways are going to be abnormal protein, abnormal lipo, and abnormal carbohydrate. It's impossible. It's inseparable. It's going to happen. It's never going to be perfect with, with these medications. It's not. And they're, they're, they're reaching real deep to try to figure that out. And they're not going to. Now they're using, like, they're trying to use four medications at one time now. Crap. <laughs> um... Uh, GGTP, that's a lot of times for gallbladder. Not a lot of people don't test for that, but if you're having gallbladder dysfunction or gas or bloating, um, or uh, a food poisoning could cause that liver to back up and you could have uh, a swollen gallbladder or what they call cholecystitis. Um, neurological disease, biliary stasis, there's just bile gets thick and sluggish and that's why we use the beta food, AF beta food in our office. And then uh, GGTP decreased in, you could have low magnesium, uh, hypothyroid, and then hypothalamus. Just, it's just not being regulated. Here's a blood chemistry of a lady that I just saw. And I put her on, um, these were her numbers. Her blood chemistry on 8-9, her ALT, uh, which is her um, SGO, uh, SGPT, was 221, and her AST, which is her S, uh, GPT, I think, is 163. And then, um, what was the, the ALP? I don't know if that's right. I had a blank on that. But that was high. But I had her on that Vitanox, that Silly Marin, and that Livitrit Plus. Now, I had her on these things, not because I was treating her for anything in particular, but her blood work looked real ugly, and I wanted to fix her numbers. Okay? It's a nice way of saying it. Because when she went to her medical, they didn't want to do anything about it. They just said, oh, you just recover on its own. When you have that much damage, you ain't recovering on its own. Put her on Vitanox, Silly Marin. Uh, Vitanox is the cucumarin, the green tea, the rosemary, the turmeric. Silly Marin uh, at high levels, not just the uh, regular milk thistle. I had her on a lot of that, and then the Livitrit has some uh, liver restorative properties in it uh, for that specific problem. And it took me uh, just under uh, two months to, to tank all those numbers down. Uh, people hear about C-reactive protein. Kind of finish up with this. 
Um, C-reactive protein is a good value. It, it, you know, if you've got any inflammation from uh, infection in the arteries to coronary artery inflammation to arthritis, basically any inflammation, uh, you're going to have a high C-reactive protein. So those are one of the factors that we test for uh, in the office uh, uh, or send out to have your medical doctor run or go, go to a laboratory to have those run. And Dr. Tent's going to be talking about that at his uh, next lecture uh, for Christmas on the number one um, killer in America, which is one of these factors. I, didn't, I left out the other ones, but those are also blood parameters. But he's going to talk about all that at his next lecture. So don't, don't miss that. That's December um, on something very important that you, you definitely want to know about. And then increased fibrinogen, you also want to look at that. You might want to look at your uh, erythromyte sedimentation rate that shows inflammation. That might be a possibility, but any one of these things, you want to always want to back up with one or two of these other factors. So it gets pretty complicated. I mean, hematology is a, a very, uh, in my mind, it, it, very credible. I respect hematologists. I mean, it, it's just there's a lot to know. There's a lot of information. Uh, here's an independent study on diabetes showing that um, C-reactive protein, they wanted to predict, see if they could predict diabetes just by checking C-reactive protein. And during the study, um, results show C-reactive protein would be an important predictor of diabetes development. So independent of other predictors, including st starting level, bone, um, Body mass index, fasting triglycerides, and glucose. If you've got a high C-reactive protein, you could definitely, your glucose might be normal because that's the last thing to show up in the, in the picture, okay? That's why blood work, oh, yeah, you're fine. You're fine. Keep on going, okay? And it showed that the highest group was associated with a greater than three-fold risk of developing diabetes at five years. Thus, C-reactive protein predicts type 2 diabetes in middle-aged me's or men, <laughs> these results have potential in helping to better predict those destined to develop type 2 diabetes. Okay? Questions? Do you have those sheets? Yeah, one up here. Okay. Are you looking for these? Any questions? Yeah. You can have that. No, I have one. These will oh, be yes. Yeah. yes. How often should you have a complete uh, con con contact reflex analysis checkup? Check on the contact reflex analysis, uh, you know, as far as getting checked on that, and, and I like to see everybody at least every three or four months. The same as, same as. No, just to get checked and, and, and make sure you're doing the right thing and following up with your, your specific problem. Well, that check, oh, your specific problem. Yes. So checking all your organs out. Well, I mean, you could, you could check all your organs out, but there's over 250 points in here. That's all. Okay, it's not, it, I mean, it's not that realistic. Like, like I said, you want to look at your blood work. You want to look at the reflexes that are involved with that particular system. So you need knowledge. It's just not pushing somebody's arm down or you know, saying, hey, this is this reflex active. You know, you got to think behind it. It just tells you there's a problem there. It doesn't tell you what it is. So blood work, your symptoms, hair analysis, uh, um, saliva testing, probably start doing. There's a bunch of different things. But uh, just in your particular situation, there's, general, there's a general test that I would do depending on who you are. Like for you that walk in, I check your, your carotid stroke, I check your blood pressure, I check your fluid retention, um, um, I'd obviously check your liver. Hydrochloric acid is a definite for, for stomach. Um, I mean, and then I, you check your angina reflex, your heart reflex, I check your carotid stroke reflex. I mean, there's things that go on in my head just from knowing the technique that I'll automatically identify with his age group and with his uh, specific uh, um, uh, possible problems that he can encounter at his age. Okay? Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. <laughs> the last slide, I can catch all of it. Uh, and uh, C reactive protein uh, had a uh, greater than 4.18 milligrams per liter, I guess it was. Yeah. 3.07 times the risk of what? Diabetes. Yeah, it was a diabetes study. Yep. 
Copper anemias. I'd be looking at if I if, if I were you, I'd probably go to a hematologist and ask him that question. Say, listen, I've been on these medications, or I'm sorry, these supplements or whatever you've been trying, you know, on your own. Can we look at? There's about 15 different anemias out there. You might be overlapping with one of those others if you're one of those those few cases. Yeah. Are these ranges good for children as well, or is some of them? have different pediatric ranges versus adult ranges for the blood work? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty general. I mean, um, I don't know that you'd have to ask, uh, you'd have to ask the lab about, about that. There's no way I can memorize all the numbers and the ranges. It depends on the specific lab, their tests, um, and, um, and what, what type of guidelines they're going by. So, uh, to answer your question, most of the time it's, it's, it's very similar. Yeah? What can you do to increase your mineral absorption? I've been taking omega-3s and uh, really the other levels seem to be falling off. Can I do minerals? And I've got high mercury, maybe that's... I, I would say probably that the Zypan, uh, the, the HCL, plus the, the trypsin, chymotrypsin, plus a little bit of the pancreatic enzymes, plus a little bit of the... the, uh, the the um, for bile and, and lipase to help you absorb your fats a little bit. So that's what I would do. I'd probably use that Zypan at it. And I would dose that depending on how, uh, how that made your stomach a little bit more warmer than normal. And that's what I would do because if you don't have a good pH, there's no way you're going to acidify to, to absorb most of your, most of your, your calciums, your potassiums, your irons, your magnesiums. You're not going to absorb them. If you're high, if your pH is low, you're acidic. Yeah. Seven's neutral, like water. Five, five, five. Right. And it doesn't, it depends. You know, you got saliva pH, you got urine pH. There's a whole world out there of, of how you do this, how you do that with that particular technique. But as far as I'm concerned, if you're not absorbing your minerals, you probably just want to fix your stomach or your digestion. And the best way to do that is with that, that Zypan and to dose that. There's, there's a couple different blood tests that you can test. You can test your albumin levels. You can test uh, your GGTP levels. There's about four or five tests you can tell just on hydrochloric acid. But you know, you're better off just dosing yourself symptomatically. It's easy to do symptomatically. It costs a lot for those tests. But most people, if you're having problems with your irons or any other type of uh, um, uh, mineral metabolism, definitely uh, your stomach. Now, who's, uh, who's Laura, or Linda, I'm sorry, Linda O'Brien? Come on up here, Linda, you filled out the sheets. <clears throat> She's got 10 years. Manager. Where do you work? Come on. <laughs> Is it okay if I tell them that those abbreviations right there? IRS. Huh? What is this? Okay, good. I thought she worked for the IRS. <laughs> come, on, come on over here. I don't want anybody to throw an apple at me or anything. Now, let's test her. Put your arm out. Hold tight. She's had migraines. Tell me about these migraines. Can we get any better as you age? No. All right, so it's a nice stress thing. Put your arm on the hole as tight as you can. I'm going to push down the knees. Apple cigarette. There's a nice, is that a Granny Smith or a, what kind of apple is this? Granny Ever since I went to the apple orchard, I can't remember any names. They threw out 50 of them. What kind of apple is this? No, those are my favorite. These are the caramel ones. <laughs> She's a good tester. <laughs> so why did that she, do that? 
Because, you know, that's 3,000 chemicals, and that will draw energy away from your body. Anything bad for you will always test weak or negative. Okay? <laughs> Hold strong. Good. Now, let's go through her reflexes. We're trying to find a couple of her reflexes. Her hormones might be one. Uh, metabolic, probably not that big of an issue, but probably your these, this one, this one, and these. Hold strong. Let's start with salt. There's her salt. Check her brain. How's your brain? Good. Good. Right side of her body. Staph. Reflex. Strep reflex. Yeast in your belly button. Here's her virus reflex. Good. Put your arms out like that. Let's check that heart muscle of hers. Hold tight. Is that a new coat? No. I don't. <laughs> Watch that. Do you want to take it off? Nope. It just smells like that new leather. Good. Now, check her hormone. Check right on that, the bridge of that nose. There's her master hormones. So her hormones are doing good now. Check her mineral level. You got two dehydration re reflexes, salt and minerals. Check her bees. Now hold as tight as you can. That's what I'm going to get around right there. Positive. Uh, why would that be negative on you? Positive, negative. Let me see that organic minerals in there. Have you ever had any thyroid problems in your family? I might. Put your arms out like that. Hold as tight as you can. <laughs> now, this is the problem we're having with her. That's her calcium tissue deficiency. Anytime you have a low calcium tissue deficiency, or you have a low mineral deficiency, you're going to test. She's testing probably for hyperthyroidism. Okay? Hold strong. Good. Negative. Let's check two things on you. There's your calcium. Nope, she doesn't want that. Let me see that. Um, let me see that. GTA Forte, do we have any of that? Not the two. What do you like? Do you drink coffee? You like to drink pop? That's probably where your calcium's so crappy. <laughs> Hold strong. No, oh, she's not testing for that. Let me see that nitro from PMG. She likes their calcium. I got her on her calcium right off the bat. What's that mean? I don't like that. I have you, done enough. We got to get your tissue calcium level up. You definitely got osteoporosis. What? Uh, Thytrol from PMG. Yep. Put this arm out. Low tissue calcium, so you have osteoporosis? How bad? Everybody's got osteoporosis. You start, women start losing their bone at 21 years of age. They like to put the osteopenia in there, and then they throw the osteoporosis and, and all that stuff. And they got you being scanned every four to six months. That's crazy. Make you take a pill every week. A pill? You make you take that, is it Fosamax or something? Causes esophageal cancer. I'm so sure. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you're getting tired. So should I get off of that? Two, four, six. She's an eight on her calcium. That's how deficient you are. So as far as I'm concerned, if you're that deficient and that Fosamax is supposed to be doing something, your cal tissue calcium should be higher than that. So there's something else causing that. Hold that. Let's go through her. I want to check one thing on her. Here's her stomach. Good. Good. Something's positive, negative. We said thytrophin. I think her thyroid's running a little bit too hot, and she's burning up most of her calcium. That's why your thyroid. Would you have your mind have hyper or hypo? It wasn't working. It wasn't working. She was like, yeah. she couldn't even move. She was fatigued, so it just burned out. Mm -hmm. did, they, did she drink any, like, nuclear things? They did something to her. They, they took a pill every week. Yeah, they probably just gave her Synthroid or something. Did your heart ever race? Oh, yeah. Yeah. If she got a thigh, she got a hyperactive thyroid. She's burning her calcium a little bit too quickly. She's turning it over from her bones. 
and you'll ache. You'll be real sore, you'll be real fatigued, especially when you pick up an infection or any type of fever. So I don't know why most medical doctors say, oh, your body will just turn over its own calcium and its bone. Why are you better off giving a little bit of calcium from the diet? This is, her thi this is how bad her thyroid is. And it's probably a bunch of different things that can irritate thyroid. Cortisol, obviously, from her stress, but testosterone can irritate that. Estrogen can irritate that. There's a bunch of different things. Two, four, six, eight, nine. She's so high on that, I'd probably use one of those herbal um, thyroid things to play with your thyroid a little bit better. Because you're going way too fast. She's a nine on that. If she didn't respond probably within a month, doing three in the morning, three around dinner time, I'd probably, what's that? Thytrophin PMG. That's, that's all the raw materials for your thyroid, all the precursors so you can convert, okay? And kind of slow your thyroid. She's going to write it down. But that's what I would do if I had a fast thyroid to stabilize that, and then I give her that calcium lactate so she can fill her tissue uh, calcium levels up. But i give her probably about a month on that. If she's not feeling extremely better, I'd probably have her run a thyroid panel or do some basal uh, uh, temperature reading or do something like that, okay? But I definitely want her on the, uh, the calcium. She's got to be on the calcium lactate. I pro she's on, she was, how, long, how high were you on that? Eight. She was an eight on that. I want her at four in the morning, four before she goes to bed. And then I want it. that's a five to one ratio of calcium to magnesium. That's the ratio in your tissue normally. And then um, thytrophin PMG three twice a day, okay? Mm -hmm. Get that right out of the office. Oh. Yep. It was nice meeting you. <laughs> so she's got a hyperthyroid. It's burning up her calcium, tissue calcium's too high. She's running a little bit too high. Plus she's skinny mini, so she needs some protein. She probably needs a little bit of that tyrosine and that, 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 that tyrosine to help with her thyroid uh, to balance out her thyroid because that's the main amino acid for your thyroid function. All right, who else? Anybody have any other questions? Yes. Yeah, you're doing all this stuff on her, and I'm having some of the same stuff now. I'm taking armor thyroid, but I went to the, you know, I had a bone density, yeah. and it has gotten worse. I was taking the false medicine. but I quit taking that because I can't prevent it. Well, it's your thyroid. your thyroid is, anything? Any yeah, I had a pituitary tumor. Okay. And then I had radiation, so that means I probably don't have any pituitary doing what it needs to be doing, maybe. Right. That, that, that pituitary makes um, thyroid releasing hormone. Yeah, right. That's what they're doing. Is that what they're giving you? Well, I'm getting uh, armor thyroid is what I'm taking. Okay. And cortex, which I guess is for Right, the cortex for the adrenals. Yeah, and I tell you, I feel a lot better. Oh, yeah? I just had, you know, it's really good. They gave me prednisone first, but I'm being great for prednisone. I would probably, um, not on her right now, not on Linda, I wouldn't do that probably on Linda right now. I already talked about that in my next lecture about that methania and the research on TSH, T3, T4, adrenal function, all that stuff just on that pill to help uh, balance if your thyroid's off, your adrenals are going to be off. Your adrenals are tanked, your thyroid's going to have to run fast. And that's where you're running trouble. I'm glad you reminded me. I would have forgot all about this, and it would have made it clear to her. But when your adrenals are real, when they're over the top and you're producing a lot of cortisol, your thyroid's got to take off faster. So when your adrenals are asleep, your thyroid has to run very fast. And they, vice versa, it's a teeter-totter. So that's why he's giving you the Cortef to balance the thyroid and adrenals because they both interact together. Is that when she starts shaking? Yes. That's when she said, that, that's what it is. That's, any, every thyroid will shake. They feel like, not necessarily they're shaking externally, but a lot of times they'll feel like they're wobbling or they're shaking internally. And that's a thyroid patient. That's, thyroid, that's lack of thyroid or too much? We gotta play with her a little bit. I think she's getting, her thyroid's running a little bit too much because her adrenals are exhausted. Okay? So instead of the core teff, I'm going to play her thyroid to balance that out. I'm going to give her a little bit of the calcium lactate to help with that. But if I need to, I'm going to, I'm going to support her adrenals. Okay, now in my case, then I'm taking the core teff and I'm taking mm -hmm. the thyroid. <clears throat> yep. What should I do for calcium? Because I have osteoporosis and it's 
I would, I'd probably use that Osteo B plus from Biotics as a bone product. Osteo B plus, I'd probably be doing maybe two in the morning, two at night. That's kind of a big pill because it's, it's a bone. It's all, it's got moldenium, boron, it's got a bunch of different stuff for bone function. It's got some enzymes in there, but the main function you want, two in the morning, two at night, if you have that big of a problem, and then a little bit of teaspoon of apple cider vinegar so you make sure you dissolve that and it goes where it's supposed to go. Uh, from our, our office, over, uh, we, have a, we have a car from our office. Yeah, I have them on the table. Yeah, I'll give you a, a car. You can just walk in and you just get it there. Yes? If you have a high C-reactive protein count, what, if you had a high C-reactive protein count, what uh, symptoms would you have other than normal? Blood you wouldn't have a lot. That's why we have people run it. Right. You wouldn't have a pain, any pain. You could have a little angina, but um, see a lot of with these blood tests, you know, you're 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 not you're pre-symptomatic. You're not having any symptoms. That's why we, that's why a lot of times we're running four or five panels that Dr. Dent's going to talk about his next lecture because a lot of people are pre-symptomatic. They don't have anything. Like I'm doing fine. Where would angina come? Is it coming here? Or where yeah, it's, it, angina's right where uh, from. Uh, if you if you draw go halfway in your clavicle, bring it down to the nipple line, and it's right in there. Right. Like, that's a coronary artery, main supply right of the artery. And that'll be tight in there. A lot of times they'll tell that's the E2 reflex, that's your magnesium reflex, just to relax that coronary artery. That's the number one cause of disease of death in females is coronary artery spasm, not clots like men get. Not that women don't get it, but it's more prevalent in men. And you can check that out by Yep. Come on up here. Let's check it. I had uh, I have ten uh, ten brothers who died from heart attacks in their early late fifties, early sixties. And so I have a low potential. All right. I know I have a high cigarette. You got a high cigarette roll down. It's a nine. You're a nine on the three scale? All right. So she's definitely got some inflammation going on in her arteries. Hold tight. That's for blockage. Blockage. You ain't testing for blockage. Good. Hold tight. Positive. Negative. You ain't testing for that. Hold tight. You have a pretty good valve, mitral valve. I have no idea. Let me see that. Yeah. Press it down at night or am I going to just get the tightness? Mm -hmm. Nope, she doesn't want that cardio. Let me see that E2. Mm -hmm. She's testing for that angina. And a little bit of that mitral valve. The valve on that, and then that left side of the heart that I'd probably do that magnesium on her. How's your blood pressure been? You got pretty low? Perfect. Does that mean you're healthy? I would, I would probably put her on one or two of these magnesium in the morning on an empty stomach and one before she goes to bed on an empty stomach because magnesium is a great beta blocker and relaxes the... Yeah, do two in the morning and two at night. You can't do it with salts, phosphorus, fiber, iron, because magnesium is the, the biggest deficiency in America. But you, I know, but you need to get up to my Well, you gotta find that, that bowel tolerance. Two, uh, yeah. In the morning? Two five hundreds at night. Two five hundreds at night? All right, I'll, uh, let me think about that, but I'll probably have you on that. Two, uh, I'll probably have you on about. That's not 500s, is it, each? That's probably, isn't that 150, 200? That's because that's awfully no, high. They're 500, so that's why she's moving it quick. Thank you, Frank. That's why she's moving her bowels, probably, if she takes too much. Yeah, That's a pretty high dosage for that. You take more than two, even if you... Two is fine. OK. 
Good. That I would do. You're doing the right thing on the magnesium, and I'd probably have her. Just, just when you sit down. Do you sigh a lot? I know. Do you sigh a lot? Like that? Does she do a lot of that? I think she does. Does she? I'd have her on that E2, Gataplex E2 at three twice a day on that. Sighing a lot is lack of oxygen. It's too much carbon dioxide in the blood. You know, take deep breath and you'll sigh. Okay? I want her doing that E2 is probably the best thing to uh, dilate that artery. And I want to see if that doesn't work, I'll add that cataplex G, and that will really relax everything around it. I have to add my uh, C-reactive protein, and what the doctor wrote for you, didn't they? Okay. He gave you that enzyme. You get that enzyme for it. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you use. Yeah, because yours was probably a, 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 a viral, a viral inflammation, not necessarily a diabetic inflammation. Well, I had him worry then. So that had me, but he brought it down and said at three months, Good. down to 0 0.5. Great. You know, that's very important. It's a huge risk factor for heart disease. Mm -hmm. But I would do the E2 three twice a day. I don't know if you're doing that or not yet, but that's what I would do for about two weeks. If you don't see a response in that, I would add the cataplex G. That's when we get runners and athletes in that to hyperoxygenate their heart. Okay, the G to relax, the E2 to open up and dilate. Okay, but that's what I would do. Keep up the magnesium. Do the E2, and if we need to, we'll use the Cataplex G, that, that riboflavin part of the B. Okay? okay? Thank you. Yes? Um, I was fine all evening, and then about 10 minutes ago, those legs got real fancy, jumping. Uh huh. Know, the whole body jumped a little. It's coming down now, but what in the world causes that? Well, you, you're probably having a little, I mean, your body can get a little stagnant. Your body you might want to walk around on that a little bit, but. I got you on that, that uh, I got you on that calcium lactate, don't I? On what? I got you on calcium lactate. Yeah, you put me on that tonight. Yeah, I got you on that tonight. So that's why antsiness to restlessness, all that. Okay. That will help out tremendously. All right, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Yes. No, that one's on wow. Oh, what is the one on that? Uh, I'm not doing one on that. Oh, I thought you said you were. Sorry. No, no, I, I, I did do about four or five lectures on the thyroid before, but I haven't got one on tape yet, and I am going to do one in the future, definitely. Okay. So, but it's not anytime right now. But, yeah, that, that's just on the research. Thanks for coming. I, I hope you guys have a good night, and 